Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everyone. So, alhamdulillah, we are, um, I'll give you guys a minute to get on inshaAllah ta'ala. And uh, we'll just prepare inshaAllah. Because I've realized that I start too fast and I don't give uh, anyone a chance to log on. So I'll give you guys a chance inshaAllah to get on. <clears throat> Okay, so um, first of all, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Salatu Wassalamu Ala Rasulillah Wa Ala Alihi Wa Sahbihi Wa Man Wala First of all, obviously we missed yesterday because of the uh, the situation and again I was just kind of too caught up with everything that's going on um, So I do apologize, so basically the way that um, The way we're actually going to structure today inshallah ta'ala is that uh, We'll go ahead and do just eight and we'll do the live stream and then I'll take a 10 minute break inshallah ta'ala after juz 8 and then I'll start another live stream right away inshallah ta'ala where we'll start on juz 9 so today we're actually going to cover two juz but I do want to keep them as uh, separate videos inshallah ta'ala just for the sake of uh, storing them and hopefully they can be used in the future um, as well so we left off with uh, juz number 7 with surat al-an'am and right now we move into uh, Juz 8, which is still within Surah Al-An'am. And as we said, this was revealed towards the end of, um, towards the end of Mecca. Uh, so it's sort of now a warning to the people of Mecca and the last call to the people of Mecca, while also tying in the Madani elements, the Medina elements that, we, that we've seen in the Surahs that come before. So as we move on to this Juz in particular, when it comes to Surah Al-An'am, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts, so it starts off at verse 111. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَوْ أَنَّا نَزَّلْنَا إِلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةَ وَكَلَّمَهُمُ الْمَوْتَى And even if we were to send upon them the angels themselves, and even if the if the dead that, that have experienced what we're warning them of were to speak to them, were to actually come back and speak to them, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا كَانُوا لِيُؤْمِنُوا They would not believe إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ الله Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they would not believe except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills, but most of them will remain in their ignorance. And so the idea here is that again, no matter what happens, whether an angel comes to you and speaks to you, if we were to show you the matters of the unseen, if we were to allow the dead to speak to you, you still would not be guided unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills. Now the idea here, illa an yasha Allah, this is actually a prominent trend within this juz, the idea of Allah's will. Surah Al-An'am in general is uh, a surah through which you could learn the entire creed. You know, really the, 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 the aqidah and the theology of Islam is really contained within Surah Al-An'am. So this idea of the Mashi'ah of Allah, the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's highlighted so frequently in the ayat. So I'm actually going to point out, I'm going to stop you guys inshallah ta'ala when we come across anything that mentions the will of God and how that relates to predestination and our choices. Um, inshallah ta'ala, because it's important to note that uh, that trend in this surah in particular. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning that even if all the proofs in the world were to come to them, they would not believe unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills. Now to say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forces people into this disbelief is wrong. Essentially what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning is that they have turned away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of his proofs, they've turned away from all of the messengers, the prophets that came before. So what makes you think that they're going to believe now? What makes you think that they're going to be able to see it now? And basically, if Allah unlocks a person's heart, when a person turns that heart to Allah, when a person expresses willingness to be guided, when a person unlocks their heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they're willing to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they're willing to believe in the matters of the unseen, even if they've never seen them before. So let's compare the beginning of the Qur'an basically to this. The first ayah of Surah Al-Baqarah, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِي هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ The first verse of the Qur'an are those who believe in the unseen. Why? Because they believe that this is divine legislation, so they accept what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals to them. So here now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after summarizing all of these rejections that came to the previous prophets, to Moses, to Jesus, to Abraham, to David, peace be upon them all, and the people of Mecca rejecting Muhammad, uh, re rejecting Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Allah says, no matter what they saw, 
they still would disbelieve. Okay, no matter what Allah shows them, they'd still disbelieve, which shows you that it's a matter of the heart. It's a matter of taqwa. If a person is pious and if a person is paying attention to the instruction of their Lord and to the divine instruction that comes within these scriptures, then even if they see nothing, they will believe. If a person has insisted on keeping their heart away from Allah, Allah will keep that heart locked and Allah will seal their vision no matter what they see. If they were to see previous nations speaking to them, if they were to see angels, they would still reject uh, divine truth. So this is sort of the trend now uh, that we have that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to mention throughout uh, the eighth juz. Uh, the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, li uh, To every prophet, there was an enemy that has been set up for that prophet. Shayateen al insi wal jinn. Whether they are devils from the human beings or from the demons themselves, from the jinn themselves. And these people, uh, you know, or, or these shayateen, they try to lead people astray from these prophets. And Allah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَوْ شَاءَ رَبُّكَ مَا فَعَلُوهُ فَذَرْهُمْ وَمَا يَفْتَرُونَ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and had Allah willed, they would not be able to do any of that. These shayateen would not exist, they would not be able to tempt and lead astray. So leave them and leave their heresies. So again, the Mashia, the will of God is being mentioned here as well. So the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being mentioned to these prophets and to the believers that you will have adversaries, you, you will have people that will, uh, that will challenge you in your faith, and that's a means of keeping you stronger and keeping you upon the path. So right away in this just the first two verses, Allah mentions His will with both wisdoms. Again, Allah does not prohibit a person from finding guidance. Allah does not stop a person from finding guidance that's willing to find guidance, that's looking for guidance. Allah never leads a person astray that's seeking guidance. That's illustrated in Surah Al-Fatiha, إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Guide us to the straight path. So why would we ask Allah for guidance if Allah is going to guide us in the way that He wants to guide us anyway? So it's a matter of how we respond to His guidance and based upon that, we ultimately uh, go astray or we go towards the right path and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who are guided. So the first two verses, the will of God, the two wisdoms are already mentioned, okay? One of them that no matter what is shown to a person that does not want to receive guidance, that person will not believe if they have insisted on misguidance. Number two, it's better for the believers, for the prophets and their followers to be challenged in their faith because that's a means of keeping them firmer. And, you know, don't waste too much time, uh, you know, uh, wondering about them, but rather focus on yourself and focus on keeping yourself firm on that path of guidance. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse 116, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you were to follow the majority of those upon earth, they will mislead you from the path of God. This is a very, very powerful verse because Allah is telling us don't follow the majority, that the path of guidance you know, is not necessarily restricted or it's not necessarily manifest in the majority of the people of the world. Look for guidance honestly with integrity and follow that path of guidance no matter who's upon it, no matter who's following it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning that it's not a necessity for truth that it be adopted by the majority. And of course, the believers now in a Mecca context, in a Meccan context, because this surah is in the end of Mecca, they are truly in the minority, right? They're truly in the minority. This is a small group of believers in Mecca that are that that are that are living amongst idol worshippers and being persecuted for not being idol worshippers. The next surah is going to put them in the Madani context, in the Medina context, where they're suddenly the majority. They're in Medina and they're a majority, but here they're really a minority. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is saying, just because you're a minority, don't take that as a sign that guidance uh, that, that that guidance is not with you. Okay, so you are in the minority, but you are the ones that are applying. The, the, the commands of God and doing what you're supposed to do. So stay put on that. Stay put on that no matter what. And don't buckle to the social pressure around you. So subhanAllah, the next several verses are actually once again about the laws of, of food. Why? Because it's social pressure. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't eat from the things that have been slaughtered in, in the names of other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't eat from those animals that have been slaughtered, the meat that's been slaughtered in the names of the idols because they used to sacrifice in Mecca to the idols. So hold firm to your path. Don't buckle to the social pressure around you. Stick to worshiping God and, and sticking upon that path that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laid out for you. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, so just like there's a majority that will stay away, it only takes a few dedicated individuals for guidance to shine light. So in verse 122, this is actually a verse that was revealed at the, you know, according to the scholars, of many of the scholars, about the Islam of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, the conversion of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O man kana maytan fa ahyaynahu wa ja'anna lahu nuran yamshi bihi fil nas. Uh, and is, is one who was dead and we gave him life. He was dead and we gave him life and we made for him light by which to walk amongst the people. So most of the scholars say this is referring to Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu. Why? Because the believers were not just the persecuted minority, they were from the weakest people of Mecca. They were, a, they were of the lowest social class. So obviously the influencers also have to, you know, you have to see some people become Muslim amongst them or some people accept guidance amongst them. And that's exactly what happened. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu accepted Islam and suddenly they were able to proclaim their faith publicly. They were able to protest, you know, the injustices that were being committed towards them for, you know, insisting upon that guidance. And the entire tide in Mecca has changed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, don't follow the majority, things will come around. And here you have Umar al Khattab radiallahu anhu coming around. So that's verse 122. And then Allah mentions in verse 125, And so whoever Allah wishes to guide, Allah will expand his heart to contain Islam. And that's exactly what happened to Umar al Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes to misguide, then his heart is going to be ضيق uh, haraja. You know, it's going to be constricted and tough, as if he was yasa'adu fi sama, as if he's trying to climb through the skies, right? So meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open the hearts of those who Allah, who, 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 uh, who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills to guide. And those that insist upon misguidance, they're going to find constriction in their hearts. And that's exactly what happened. The believers were not bothering anybody. You know, subhanAllah, in Mecca, they were not causing any problems whatsoever. The persecution towards them was for them saying, La ilaha illallah, and nothing else. They were not trying, they were, they were not doing any, they were not disrupting society, right? They were, they were a civilized bunch. But the misguided people, the, the majority, the oppressors, you know, they had so much constriction in their hearts and so much noisiness because they turned away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah mentions that what Allah wishes good for a person, Allah opens their hearts towards Islam. And that's exactly what we see happening with Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. His heart was opened, was expanded um, to be able to contain um, Islam. In verse 133, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَرَبُّكَ الْغَنِيُّ ذُ الرَّحْمَةِ And your Lord is free of need and He's the possessor of mercy. إِنْ يَشَأْ يُذْهِبَكُمْ if he wants, if he, if he wills, again, the Mashi of Allah, if Allah wills, then he can do away with you. Uh, that, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would, would, uh, would give you succession with people after you that he wills. So the Mashi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioned here. The will of God is mentioned here that, look, Allah does not need you and I. If Allah willed, he could have replaced us with someone else. So basically, we should feel the favor of God upon us that He chose us to be amongst those who were uh, who, who receive divine guidance. Who uh, you know, in, in the person of the Prophet Sallallahu and in the Scripture of the Quran, we should feel privileged by that. That Allah Subhanahu wa Taala guided us, despite obviously the troubles that comes uh, that come with 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 submitting to the path of God, with being upon divine revelation, with upholding that set of moral values. Obviously, you're going to have troubles that come your way. But if Allah willed, He could have replaced you. So you are amongst the favored of God by virtue of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having allowed you, uh, to, to your heart to be able to contain this message uh, that He has sent to you. So after that, you have more laws of food, uh, you know, the, the sacrifices at the time. Because remember, sacrifice at that time in Mecca is a form of ibadah, it's a form of worship. So it falls really within the same category of prayer and fasting and so on and so forth, because this was their means of illustrating their, you know, their or, or showing their reverence to their idols. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps on insisting on people upholding the laws uh, in regards to their food and their sacrifices, this is because it falls within ibadah, especially in a Mecca context, especially within Mecca. 
And then in verse 147, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِن كَذَّبُوكَ So if they turn away from you. So we just mentioned the verse 133 where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that your Lord is free of need and he's full of mercy. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills, he could do away with you and he could replace you with another group of people. In verse 147, the same thing is illustrated here. فَإِن كَذَّبُوكَ And if they deny you, O, o Prophet of Allah, فَقُرْ رَبُّكُمْ ذُ الرَّحْمَةِ so know that your Lord is the possessor of mercy and not just the Rahmah, not just mercy, but the Rahmah wasi'a. It is an expansive mercy. Your Lord is the possessor of vast mercy, meaning you can come back to him that he, you know, he, he has not, uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not uh, neglect your repentance if you are to repent, even if you've denied the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, his punishment will not be repelled from the people who insist on oppression and insist on, on rejection and so on and so forth. So the Prophet ﷺ is told to tell them that, look, if you turn away, your Lord is still merciful. He is one of vast mercy. Then you could hope that he would not punish you. But at the same time, if you insist upon wrongdoing, then the punishment cannot be repelled from God. And then so verse 161 to 163 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says uh, to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, قُلْ إِنَّنِي هَدَانِي رَبِّي إِلَىٰ صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ Say that my Lord has guided me to the straight path. دِينًا قِيَمًا a, a, a correct religion. مِلَّةَ إِبْرَاهِيمٍ It is the way of Abraham. حَنِيفًا وَمَا كَانَ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ Always inclining towards monotheism, always inclining towards the truth. And he was not amongst those who associated others with Allah. So again, the emphasis is on Ibrahim salam, the Prophet Abraham, who is of course uh, the father uh, of, of, of monotheism, in that sense, the father of the Abrahamic way. Um, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, say that you are upon the way of Ibrahim salam, that, that that's what you're going to stick to. And this is of course to the people of Mecca. Right now, it's really directed to the audience of Mecca. These people who are slaughtering for the sake of idols, and these idols are placed in the same house that has been built for the worship of one God. So it's, it, it doesn't make sense, right? It doesn't make sense. You're using the, the, the house that's been built for the sake of God by the father of monotheism to be a place of sacrifice in the name of polytheism. It doesn't make sense. So the Prophet is told, say that I'm going to stick to the true way of Ibrahim alayhi salam, millata Ibrahim hanifa. And it's the, it's, it's the straight path, always inclined towards the truth. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِ وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ So say that my prayer, my sacrifice, my living and my dying are for Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. The idea here, so again, to show you where uh, sacrifice falls into, right? The sacrifice is falling in the same category as salah, as prayer here. So say that my prayer and my sacrifice, and this is referring to the rites of sacrifice. It's actually referring to animal sacrifice. And my living and my death are only for Allah, the Lord of the worlds. La sharika lah. There is no partner to be associated with Him. Wa bidhalika umirtu wa ana awwalu muslimin. And that's what I've been commanded to be upon. And I am the first of those who submit. I am the first of the Muslims. So this sort of gives you that, uh, you know, the, the end of Surah Al-An'am, an insistence upon upholding the way of Abraham, upholding monotheism. Again, it is the surah, it is the chapter of Aqidah, it's the chapter of Islamic creed. This is how we learn our creed. Uh, you know, it, it illustrates all of the different aspects of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's dominion, His creation, what, how God, uh, you know, uh, establishes His mercy over His punishment, yet some people insist upon punishment and so on and so forth. So it's a very, very powerful discourse that we have in Surah Al-An'am. And that's really a beautiful way to really think about an ending of it, right? That you, that, that you say, listen, my prayer, my service of sacrifice, my life, my death are for Allah, the Lord of all the worlds. And that is what I've been commanded. And I'm going to submit to that. And I'm not going to associate any partners with him. So it's sort of an insistence upon that no matter what happens. Now, when you move on to the next Surah,